here's how to make your chest blast proof, and here's how to turn literal dirt into emeralds. And these are 67 surprisingly helpful things in Minecraft. And hey, as you can see from this number, we're almost at 6 million subscribers. So if you see the button down there, consider subscribing. It's free, and it helps out a ton. You see, when you waterlog something, it keeps the properties of a water source block, meaning that just by pouring a water bucket on your chest, that sucker isn't going to explode anytime soon. I see that as a small price to pay for indestructible chests. This is a lot easier to clean up. Before you visit the deep dark, you probably want to brew up a slow falling potion. As Simply Sark points out, chugging one of these can help us get around the skulk shriekers and sensors without setting them off. I mean, you could fall from any height and land on a block next to it, and as long as you're not moving side to side, you will not set off off any of the sensors, making this indispensable to have. Oh, or give slow fall into the mobs that you're trying to pull on a lead, and that way you can fly around with them on an elytra without having to worry about them dying of fall damage when you reach your destination. The chest boat might be the most useful introduction in the 1.19 update, and maybe not for the reason that you think so, because while this could help you early game to transport items across an ocean, where it's really the most useful is for its insanely large hitbox. Like check out this contraption, where if we place the chest boat right in the center of these nine hoppers, we can make an insanely fast loading and unloading loading system for our items, and that'll create maybe the most efficient furnace array that we've seen so far. Shears aren't just used for cutting down your vines, but they can also help you trim them. In recent updates, if you right click on a cave vine, kelp, or weeping vines like so, that'll set the edge to a max age of 25, which prevents them from growing any more past that point. And folks, this is a huge help for when you want to preserve the look of your build and keep those plants from growing any further than the decoration. By this point, we've talked about making a bubble elevator using kelp, which is helpful, but it requires a couple of different items. So instead, let's get the job done simpler by just carrying around ice. With this, all we have to do is pillar up ice above a soul sand block, and then mine it with a non-silk touch pickaxe on the way back down. Then when we reach the bottom, all of them will be water source blocks, and we can fly right back up to the top, keeping our elevators fast and helping us build them about as quickly. When you spend hours in a Minecraft world, it can be easy to forget what you're doing. And that's why doing something as simple as leaving a sign around the world can give you a reminder of what to do. Like this one here tells me that I need to finish this video, so I should probably do that. But jokes aside, if you were to do something like log off while you're looking at one of these reminders, then as soon as you come back into your world, you'll be able to jump right off of where you left last time. And then when you finish the to-do or the reminder, you can use dye or a glow ink sack to even make it a different color, which is a little bit more satisfying than just breaking the sign outright. And it gives you a way to look back at all the progress that you've made, which is another nice touch. Now, if you've been playing Minecraft for a while, a hoe doesn't seem that useful, but they've actually made quite the comeback. And personally, I always craft one of these whenever I enter into a village. Since we're just a stone hoe, you can break down hay bales and save fast. Or combine this with bone meal and moss and you can instantly mine different blocks down in the caves. Oh, and if you're going down to an ancient city without a hoe in your inventory, you're doing it wrong. Since this is the default item used to break down catalysts, shriekers, and skulk sensors. And in many cases, you can even break down these blocks without using high efficiency or haste too. So if you're looking for the cheapest way to instant mine down in the caves, why not use two stone and some sticks instead of your most expensive pickaxe? Here's how I increased my hotbar space tenfold. And I did it all in vanilla. Since a lesser known feature is the ability to use preset hotbars in creative mode. And to do this, all you need to do is save a hotbar by using the C key and then a number on your keyboard that you want to save the preset to. And then you can load it by pressing X and then the number that you want to use, which by itself is pretty handy for when you're doing map building. But what I find even more useful is saving different shulker boxes in those inventories. Since once you load it, the NBT data is still saved, meaning you could have shulker boxes full of custom heads ready to load at a moment's notice. And you'll save yourself a lot of time not having to type out that command. Trust me. If you don't have a water bucket or you're in the nether and want to try something new, weeping vines are the best answer. See, with these, we can hang one off of the roof and then bone meal it to reach the bottom. And that not only gives us a way to reach the base of the cave safely, but it also offers easy access back to the top. And that kind of dual purpose can be a real lifesaver. Instead of using six planks to craft a shield, why not use five and craft yourself a boat? Now, as crazy as it seems, a boat can actually be very useful for defense. Like in this situation, where if we were to fight the Enderman by ourselves, we probably wouldn't fare too well. But if we place it in a boat beforehand, then as soon as we start attacking it, it won't even teleport away. And it can't hit us. I mean, the boat is so strong that if you were to put an exploding creeper in your backseat and row the boat, you'll barely take any damage when it explodes. And as much as I love shields, you can't exactly say the same for them. So if you already craft one of these to get across the seven seas, it's worth keeping in your hot bar to get you out of a sticky situation. Here's why you shouldn't carry around an ender chest, but instead you should carry around ender chests. Because as you'll see, having multiple of these is going to make up for the extra cost. Since when you just 
carry around one, it could be easy to place it down and forget it somewhere. So then when you need it the most, you don't exactly have it on hand. And that's why I personally like to play with multiple ender chests carried around in my inventory. That way, if I just finish up setting up a new build and I want to have one there, I don't have to worry about crafting an extra. Instead, I can just place down one of the multiple that I carry. I mean, the item stacks up to 64 for a reason, so why would you ever settle for one when you could have another 63 on hand? Here's one setting that you'll want to turn off. Because if you go into your visual settings and turn off the biome blend slider, this will allow you to easily see the biome borders between the difference in grass and water color, which is pretty handy when you're looking to build things within a specific biome, like a squid or a drown farm for instance. And honestly, it's a much quicker alternative than using the F3 debug screen. And since that debug screen doesn't even exist in all versions, I think you'll find that this is a lot more user friendly. Honey blocks are great for redstone traps and traps without redstone. Let me explain. With the honey blocks unique properties, if any mob stands on top of it, they can't easily jump over. Which means that if we were to put a mob or a villager inside of a composter or a cauldron with a honey block underneath, they're not able to jump out. And just like that, we found the sticky situation that'll keep your villagers inside of the trading hall. And to go one step further, add an extra ring of honey blocks around them, and then any baby zombies can jump in to try to kill the mob as well. That way, we make sure we keep the mob safe and sound, all will they stay put. Unlike what Bob Ross told you, your mistakes aren't always gonna be happy accidents. And believe me, nothing makes a mistake worse than having to waste even more time trying to fix it. So, to get the blemish off your plate in a faster manner, why don't we just use the water for cleanup? Normally, these things are like oil. They don't mix well with water. But for our purposes, we can use that to our advantage. That way, you get the resources back faster, and you'll be able to start at square one once again without even skipping a beat. If you're gonna make a big build, you're gonna wanna get a lot of wool. Because while a lot of builders might skip this step, it could be remarkably useful to have a color-coded layout of the pattern that you're about to build off of. And that way, you can easily account for where a build will be placed and how it's spaced from other builds without having to invest all the materials to find out. Because trust me, the only thing that sucks more than finding out you build these houses too close to each other is the realization that now you're gonna have to tear it down and rebuild it all again to start from scratch. So save you and your tools the hassle and just do it out of wool next time. This trick will help you find buried treasure every single time. Because instead of trying to guess where the X means on the map, if you instead line yourself up and then use the F3 debug screen to move to where the chunk info line has a nine in the first and third spots, then if you dig straight down, it'll be right on top of the chest, which is particularly useful if the chest happens to spawn out in the water next to the shoreline, because digging around aimlessly is already a time waster. We don't need to make that any worse by having to dig slower underwater. Deep Slate is a tough block to get a lot of, since even with a haste to efficiency five pickaxe, you still can't instant mine it. But as this user points out, if we get ourselves a wither to do the job, then it actually becomes much easier. As you'll notice, the wither breaks the blocks around its head every time that it takes damage. So if you trap one of these in a tunnel contraption like so, then every time that we punch it, we're gonna get ourselves some more deep slate blocks like so. And since it does a three by three area, we can quickly make ourselves a tunnel or get ourselves some deep slate without even having to damage our pickaxe. If you've ever tried to get a skeleton to hit a creeper, then you know it's not an easy task, but it's a necessary one if we wanna fill out our music disc collection. So we'll have to get creative. And luckily this user has the right idea. See, Minecraft counts assists the same way that it does kills. Meaning if we have a skeleton shoot a piece of TNT, ignite it, and then that kills the creeper, we'll get the music disc the same way. Simple as that. If you have only three dirt blocks, you're rich, or at least richer than you might think. Since if you have three dirt blocks, it's actually possible to trade that up to an emerald. Now, the way that we do this in 1.19 is that we turn our dirt into mud using a water bottle and then dry it out on a dripstone rack like such to get ourselves our very own clay blocks, which if we then break, we can trade with a stonemason to get ourselves an emerald. It's not exactly the fastest trade, but it's definitely possible. And this proves that even when you're dirt poor, you're still not as poor as you think you are. And after changing that dirt into clay for a trade with a mason, you'll want to keep that villager on hand because these fellas can have some extra useful trades for when you're not trying to go mining or digging for your building blocks. Like why not use those emeralds that you got to get yourself all the different kinds of colored terracotta or glazed terracotta. And once you get your mason up to a master level, being able to trade an emerald for a quartz pillar or block of quartz is an insane steal. If you're using a mending bow, then you've got to use spectral arrows. Now they sound costly, but with the help of bartering, they're actually pretty easy to get in large quantities. And by using these, we're able to help keep track of the slippery mobs that might get away. Like say you're down in the ancient cities and you're trying to look for a warden. Well, if you use one of these to hit a warden, then you'll be able to track it down even when the darkness debuff is active. Which is good, because the warden's definitely not a mob that you want to turn your back on. While the swift sneak enchantment is meant to help out down in the ancient cities, it can also be useful above ground for when you're trying to speed bridge. And looking at this comparison between no swift sneak and swift sneak three, you can really see that there's a massive difference. And honestly, I'm just glad that there's a method now to speed bridge without ever learning how to speed bridge. Because if you're like me, I could never get down the timing. Looting is one of the quintessential enchantments in Minecraft, which means it's a 
bummer when it's only limited to swords. Or so you'd think. You see, if you chuck your looting three sword to your offhand slot, then you can use something like a bow and still have the enchantment applied. And from where I'm standing, that's all upsides, folks. Not only do you save from damaging your prized weapon, but you also gain a bunch of range. Sure, you still do have to walk in close to collect the items, but look at the alternative. If you're asking if I'd rather walk up to a creeper and fight it, or just pick up a pile of gunpowder, I think the choice is clear. Let's say you built a path up to your base using gravel, but later on you decided that andesite would actually work better for the build. So how do you replace it? Do you go through that whole path, removing every piece of gravel, and then place andesite into the empty holes? Because if you're doing that, you're wasting time. Rather, what you should be doing is if you have an insta mine tool and then the block you want to replace in your offhand every time that you hit left click and right click at the same time on a block you're able to instantly replace it with the block that you want to use helping you clean up those mistakes without any extra headache. Starting a farm is often a big undertaking. So whether you got that potato from a zombie drop or it's the only one you have left over from a village trip, the fact still stands that you're gonna need a lot more of those things to get the farm going. So to help out on that, that fortune three tool that you got in your hotbar isn't just good for lapis and diamonds. No, it can actually increase your crop yield as well. Sure, just how much that increases averages out to just be about one more per block. But folks, as you grow to a big farm, that can add up really fast. Past, giving you more spuds to plant and more to fortune three down the road. Everybody loves the frugal friend. So if you're able to help your friends save on materials before a big build, it goes a long way to making you the hero. And to do that, all you've got to do is make stairs on the stone cutter. Seriously, by taking your stone of choice and putting it in this machine instead of the crafting table, you can save so much more per block. And when you're doing a big project, that really adds up. Unfortunately, this trick still doesn't work on any wood stair variants. But if you're trying to make stone steps, then this can save you a couple trips to the quarry. For most of us, fences are a necessary evil. Sure, it's frustrating, that you can't jump over it, but the other mobs and such can't jump over it either, making them pretty necessary for an enclosure. Or so you thought. If you place a trap door and flip it up like such, then none of your pigs, cows, or sheep will be busting out anytime soon. But what's a trap to them actually lets you jump over with ease. Though I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that crafting a trap door compared to a fence isn't exactly resource solvent. But hey, looks come at a price, and with the added functionality to boot, I'm definitely willing to cough out the planks. When you're looking for materials in Minecraft, you're gonna have to branch mine a couple times. And while that's fine, it doesn't always feel like the fastest. But lucky for you, there might be a way to fix that. The way that it works in Minecraft, you actually mine faster when you mine at max reach distance instead of right up close. Taking that into consideration, maybe take a couple of steps back and save yourself some time. After all, if you're gonna be digging into straight line for a while, why not at least shave off some seconds where you can? And while I can't guarantee this will improve your luck finding diamonds, I can at least say it'll help you find out faster. I don't think I'm breaking any new ground by saying that netherite is a worthwhile resource to have, which makes finding ancient debris something of a necessity. And to do that, we'll take all the help that we can get. Like this, for instance. See, while Mojang doesn't intend for us to be able to see well under lava, all we need is a fire resistance potion and a slab or grindstone to trick the system. The story goes that we get underneath, position our hitbox just right, and then score a prime view of the stuff below. And since ancient debris can spawn under lava, that means we get a prime chance to find some of these pieces in a pinch. I don't think I'm breaking any new ground by saying that mining fatigue is a definite pain to deal with. And while things like a milk bucket are a good one-time fix, when you're ready to an ocean monument, you're bound to get it again. So if that's gonna be the case, here's a bit more of an all-around solution. Would you believe it, but honey and slime blocks aren't just great for flying machines, but they're also a solid pick for insta-mining down in the ocean blue. So if you got the farms to supply it, I highly recommend using these to clear out any air pockets. And then when you got those, you'll be treated to the regular sea level mining speeds that you know and love. Fighting the wither can be a fun challenge to take on, but having to fight one for the sixth time today is not as much. So to handle that repetition with a bit more grace, we'll need to take a trip to the end. From there, we can use the end portal exit for an easy wither killer. See, since we can spawn withers horizontally, if we lay out the blocks in such a way that we can essentially have it get trapped in the bedrock fountain, from which point it either suffocates by itself or we can use a smite ax and handle it no problem. The villager trading market, much like the stock market, can be a lucrative yet grueling task to undertake. Though, unlike the stock market, it's actually possible to get perfect trades for the villagers that you want. And fortunately, it's pretty easy to do that. By placing and replacing the same workstation next to a villager, you're essentially able to re-roll what they give you. Meaning not only can you get yourself a mending book villager, but you can also get it at an affordable price, which is a level of purchase power that many of us would have killed for. And if Martha Stewart had this kind of help, she probably wouldn't have ended up in prison. If you're looking to get even with another player on the server, you might need to get creative. Because as any PvP player will tell you, all it takes is a 
bit of armor in the equation and suddenly your sword and axe is doing a lot less damage to the person. So to circumvent that entirely, how about we spend a bit more time and work on the potion side? Instant harming potions aren't just good for witches. These things can actually damage through armor, which means that a direct hit from a splash potion of harming too can basically melt through your opponent's health bar even if they got on netherite. Who knows, you might not even need a sword. But to most people in Minecraft, the signs seem pretty limited. I mean, save for the different colored dyes and wood types, how much else can you really do? Well, as it turns out, through the help of Unicode characters, there's actually quite a lot that you can add to these little things. And since these characters and emojis aren't exactly obvious to use, they can add some really fun diversity to your maps. I mean, if anything, it's just so that I don't have to look at another arrow that looks like this, but instead this. It's just so much nicer. If you're trying to keep your valuables safe, then being able to detect intruders is a huge plus. But tripwire hooks are kinda obvious. So instead, we gotta rely on this little guy. Since the pufferfish's hitbox expands when it's scared, as soon as a player, or another mob for that matter, gets close, then this system will be able to detect them and deploy a trap to keep them at bay. Although, for the sake of being thorough, this will only detect players if they're in survival, but really, if you got a creative player coming towards your base, you got bigger problems than a pufferfish is gonna save. By this point, we've talked plenty about how important it is to zombify and then cure your villagers. And while that's true, I don't want to overlook the cost of curing all of those squid words for your trading hall. So to help out on the potion side, this is a simple fix. See, all that we need is for the zombie villager to have the weakness potion effect. But it doesn't have to just be done with a splash potion. So instead, why not brew up a lingering potion and do this with weakness arrows instead, giving us a lot more chances for the same potion. Getting a ton of blocks in survival is not easy to do, especially early game. But when you want to build that big tower or pillar for your build, that's going to require a lot of blocks, whether we like it or not. So to play the easy route and cut down on both mining and placing all the cobblestone, why not opt for a few buckets instead? This way, all we need is a ring of lava blocks in the desired shape, and we can use a technique called lava casting to earn ourselves a pillar in a matter of minutes. And for this little effort, that's a pretty solid deal. Building in Minecraft is a tough task, and building something that looks natural is even tougher. So to make your island project look like an organic world generation, we'll need to think of a new angle. And no, that's not just using the naturalized command and world edit, but rather, we're gonna do something that's possible in vanilla. And that answer lies with these grass and mycelium blocks. See, both of these like to spread to dirt nearby, but in very different ways. Meaning that if we place both of them on a field of dirt, then we can essentially watch the game terraform for you in real time. And then once that's done, we've got a perfectly natural looking shape to build your island base off of. The pillager mob definitely has a problem with anger management. But if you're trying to impress your friends as the master pacifist, then you should know that it's actually possible to take one of these monsters and bring it over to the good side. You see, just as crossbows work for us, they can actually have their crossbows break. Meaning that if you bait them out of enough shots, they'll eventually be left with no weapon in sight. And at that point, they might still seem a little grumpy, but sure enough, they're pacified. And while I wouldn't feel comfortable reuniting them with society just yet, with progress like this, it's definitely a step in the right direction. Inventory management is a stressful game in and of itself. So to alleviate some of that headache, why not just get yourself a pack mule? And no, not a literal pack mule. We can actually get crazier than that. After scoring yourself a fox friend, you're able to tie the fella on a lead and have it carry around an item of your choice. So what's to stop you from having to carry around something like a shulker box? That way you get plenty more slots of storage, 27 to be exact, and not to mention a buddy to also tag along in your future adventures. And honestly, I don't know which one of those is more worthwhile. Pigs and carrots are not exactly a popular form of travel by any stretch stretch of the imagination. But what they lack in land speed, these porker pariahs might just make up for in the skies. As it turns out, by switching on and off of a carrot on a stick item while riding on the swine, it can actually cause the mob to fall slower. This pork parachute might actually save you in a future manhunt. But before you go and try this out with your local pig, you might want to keep this in mind. As soon as you get close to the ground, you have to be off the pig before you land. Otherwise, it's going to be you as a pile of items right next to that dead pork chop. If you're playing on someone else's SMP, then teleportation is not a luxury that most of us have. That is, until recent updates. Because, as you can see, if I throw this ender pearl down into a bubble stream, it'll keep it steady. Which then, folks, that creates something called an ender pearl stasis chamber. Which sounds cool, but in execution, it's even cooler. If you partner this with pistons to offset the ender pearl, then you can set up a timer system to return you back to home after a day of mining. So if you just want to run away from your base for a day's journey and then come back by nighttime, this is the way to do it. 
Getting to the nether is a crucial part of any Minecraft playthrough, which is why speedrunners are always fascinated with getting there as quickly as possible, leading of course to this method for building the portal. And while that clearly works, it's not the easiest for a simpleton like me to grasp. So instead, this option is a better alternative for our slowpokes. Here, we instead dig out a pocket to build the portal swiftly underground, which might not be the most optimal, but trust me, it's a lot faster than messing up the real method and having to start over. Getting the full effect from a splash potion more often than not seems like a fantasy and not so much a reality. But as it turns out, to bring this promise into the present, all you have to do is look straight up and land a splash potion square on your noggin. By doing that, you hit the sweet spot right on your character's hitbox, and that'll help you sport the splash potion effect as advertised. Better yet, it also works with dispensers, meaning you can set up the proper potion systems to give you the full effect each time, which will have your friends wondering why your speed system works so much better than theirs. Looting desert temples is a fun pastime for sure, but what if you're trying to get the valuables without wasting your precious time? Well, that's where this method comes in. See, while most of us would just spend the seconds to individually loot each and every one of these chests, this user's method is a lot more straightforward, and instead we use the TNT from the trap below to blow up the chamber and the chest with it. And while that sounds dangerous, it's worth noting that by standing in the pit down here, it'll let us survive with barely a scratch sustained. And afterwards, we'll not only have all that treasure in our inventory, but a ton of blocks to build our way out as well. Getting enough wither skeletons skulls to summon the boss can often be a hassle. I mean, even if you go through all of the effort to get a perfectly enchanted looting three sword for the job, at best, you're still only getting a 5.5% drop chance. So if you two are sick of these games of chance, then a surefire solution that most of us tend to look over is a charged creeper. That's right, folks, they also work on the wither skeletons too. Just set up a creeper farm, charge them up with a trident, and then ship them over to the nether. Complicated? Yes, but with a 100% drop rate, at least you know it pays off. Anvil costs can get annoying pretty pretty fast. I mean, all it takes is a few enchanted books in the wrong order, and bam, it's too expensive to use. And this can get remarkably frustrating when you go to repair something. So before you find yourself in that hassle, maybe try this. Apparently, by just renaming the tool every time you go to repair, it's enough to stop the repair cost from jacking up each time. At that point, the game treats it as a simple name change operation and forgets the rest. Just some minor change like adding a space or a number to the end is good enough. It does not need to be fancy, trust me. If your hotbar doesn't have this item, then you're missing out. Because the number of things that you can do with one water bucket is insanely useful. And while there's the obvious answer of using it for an MLG water bucket save, you could also very well use this to create paths over lava, climb walls, harden concrete, or even pick up axolotls or fish. And even if you're not using it for water, you could still use that empty bucket for lava or milk when you need to. And really, carrying one of these inside of your hotbar should be just as essential as food. You really shouldn't leave the house without it. If you've ever experienced the pain of losing your base, you know it's no laughing matter. So to avoid losing all those hours of work yet again, this is a simple fix to try. First, picture something you'll always have on your inventory. Well, the first thing to come to mind is probably your special pickaxe or sword. So in that case, why not just name your main item the coordinates of your base so that you always have them handy? I mean, at least for me, I'm a lot more likely to forget my compass than I am my trusty Fortune 3 pickaxe. So that's no brainer. And hey, if you add men into it as well, that'll be even more security for your stuff. Floating in Minecraft survival sounds like a pipe dream. Or if you're in the end, a bad nightmare. So instead, if you want to use floating to your advantage, you can start by spam clicking the top scaffold on a pillar of the stuff. After a few tries of mashing your mouse button as fast as you can, you'll notice that there should be one or two scaffolding blocks floating off in the distance. Now, keep in mind, these are just client-side ghost blocks. And to any onlookers, you'll look like you're floating mid-air. But just be careful where you do this. Because if you're on a server that has flying disabled, doing this could get you kicked for flying if you stand on it for too long. Minecar rides can be a ton of fun, but unless you got the proper power behind you, you're not getting very far very fast in one of these. That is, until you partner with Minecraft's other form of travel, the boat. As it turns out, if you push a minecart on top of a boat, then it's actually possible to get the minecart inside of the boat. And from there, you're able to get inside the boat and use its power to manipulate the speed and direction of the minecart, giving you the wacky and also perfect form of travel to wherever you're headed. Villagers are a valuable asset to put to work in your world, but when you're moving them to to the trading hall, it's clear that they're not going to be the most cooperative. And honestly, that's an understatement. So to more easily move these fellas around, it's safe to say that Bedrock has a simpler option. See, the way that minecarts work here, all we need to do is place a bit of railroad track next to their bed, and then when they're sleeping, we can roll by a cart and pick them up. And folks, while this might seem like kidnapping, it uh, it frankly is. But I'd venture that this is an ends justify the means kind of deal. And in my eyes, 
that's a good enough justification. Saving resources when you can is always a good idea. So before you've collected piles upon piles of coal blocks to use for smelting, this might save you a couple mining trips. While campfires are admittedly the middle child of cooking, they do have one key feature that puts them above the rest. For an upfront investment of charcoal and logs, these things will keep burning until you tell them to stop. And fortunately for you, that means you get a bunch of long-term benefit when you're trying to cook up some food. So take the time to smelt up that one piece of charcoal. That way you can save your later fuel for the mining trip sure to come. Plenty of players in Minecraft want minimap markers. I mean, that's definitely the reason it's in every Minecraft mod pack I've ever seen. But a feature that passed most people by is that by right clicking on a banner, you're able to add it onto the map and show exactly where it is which can create some really interesting and detailed maps if you want, especially when zoomed out. Better yet, throw a name on that banner and then as soon as you right click on it, you'll actually see that custom name on the map. So if you're trying to find home, you don't have to wonder where it is. Just look on it and oh, there it is, home. Secret entrances in Minecraft are very cool to pull off, but most of the time with redstone and such, they take a lot of work. So for a simpler option, you can build one using just this one block. Seriously, if you place down a shulker box with a block above your head, you can actually phase through the shulker box when you open it up to get sneakily into your base. To any onlookers, it looks like you just fell through solid ground, which I guess you did, making this even cooler. And it's definitely the new way I'm getting into my minds. Water sources are a pretty nifty thing to have around, but they don't always match the aesthetic of a build. So to keep that big cube of blue from messing with your vibe, a simple solution is to use a waterlogged slab instead. You're still able to fill up your buckets and bottles as you would, but to any bystanders, it's just gonna blend in with the rest of the floor. And hey, as an added bonus, if your creeper rolls around there, you can rest assured that that spot isn't gonna go up in smoke, making this a safe, sleek, and sneaky option. And folks, that's not only a lot of S's, but but it also makes for a pretty great combo for your future base. Everyone's seen this before, the classic cobblestone generator. But while it's iconic, it's not exactly the fastest. So if you're looking for a better return on your skyblock profits, this format might be worth a try. With this altar-shaped setup, we not only get one block per cycle, but we get eight instead. And folks, that'll let us walk the perimeter and essentially mine around the clock without having any lulls in the cycle. Or hey, you could even enlist a couple of friends and have this work at full capacity on the multiplayer server. It's always the items that I forget to farm that I seem to need a lot of. And for all the different dyed blocks that I use, flowers can become a hot commodity. So if you're in the same boat and you just want a quick boost on orange dye or whatever you need, then this is an essential tidbit. See, in Bedrock, if you use bone meal on specific flower, then it'll spawn more of the same type nearby, letting us skip the frolicking and just focus on stockpiling. Water bucket saves aren't much of an option in the nether. And while some people would opt to use hay bales or something to MLG clutch in the lava scape, I think there's a much simpler option. You see, even though the nether isn't much for water, boats are a different story. By putting together one of these, you can hop in and simply maneuver your way off any cliff you find in front of you. Best yet, when you reach the bottom, no harm is done to your legs. And hey, if you're really wanting a showboat, then you can definitely try to pull off the classic pro tactic of getting in and out of the boat repeatedly. And then we'll all have to admit, it does look pretty cool in the process too. When you're starting out, every bit of food that you can get your hands on counts. So to make sure you're getting the best deal out of your three piece combo meal, let's play it a little smart on the resources and just use a flint and steel instead. Look, not only does this save you coal and wood for other necessities like torches and the like, but it also saves you the time of not having to cook a perfect medium rare down the road. And folks, that's the reason why speedrunners opt for this option instead. It's quicker, saves you fuel, and besides, you'll need a flint and steel for the nether anyway, so why not have some fun with it beforehand? Personally, finding little clever ways to mix around items in Minecraft is a huge joy to me. And one that recently caught my attention is mixing banners together with buttons. The way their hitboxes work, you can still interact with the button even if you can't see it behind the banner. And that makes this a very slick way to hide your redstone input wherever you want it in your base. So far, I haven't heard of anyone checking behind banners yet, so you might want to get on this trick quick before people start to catch on. After all, we wouldn't want another hidden door behind the painting trick on our hands, you know what I mean? All right, pop quiz, which of these swords is better? And while it might be easy to answer this one because it has more enchantments, I'll ask you to reconsider. Because while fire aspect and knockback can be useful in certain scenarios, they can also make fighting certain mobs into a pain. Like if all of a sudden you're fighting that enderman and then it catches on fire, now it's just gonna be teleporting about and make it way harder to kill overall. Or even 
worse, you light the mob on fire, and now it's lighting you on fire when it attacks you. And really, it's probably not worth the levels to try and put this on your sword. I'd rather just keep those on hand so that it's easier to repair. Whether you're mining down in the caves, digging up a bunch of sand, or chopping down a bunch of trees, breaking blocks is inescapable. But we don't have to be boring about it. And in fact, using a setup like this machine, we can handle our chores with both style and speed. See, for a while now, TNT has had 100% drop rate, meaning that any block that we explode is going to be ours to keep. And that makes a simple flying machine design like this really useful, since we can then launch a TNT projectile and then keep it moving on as planned, letting us get whatever we need, whether that's diamonds, logs, or even sand from a desert, at a much faster pace. Large-scale projects are a lot of fun to build in Minecraft, but without a big tool like World Edit, that big scale can start to seem daunting. So to simplify that problem and save some time, it's worth enlisting some command blocks like so. See, by laying out a slice of your build in a bounding box like this, we can save it as a structure and have it placed whenever we hold a specific item. That way, we turn building block by block into essentially painting the mountain instead. And believe me, that's a lot more fun. As soon as 1.16 kicked off, then the search for netherite was on. And since you need multiple ancient debris to actually make a netherite ingot to upgrade your tools, then you're gonna need a lot of the stuff. If you're not looking to spend the next hours of your life mining through netherrack, instead you might find better rewards by using explosives in the nether to find it. Whether it's by using bed explosions or TNT duplication, High-powered explosives is absolutely the best way to clear out the nether for your ancient debris. So while the rest of your friends are just mining for their supply, you'll be decked out to the nines. Because unlike them, you used your full arsenal, and then some. Even though fish farms got nerfed in 1.16, they're still a great source of XP. I mean, get a mending fishing rod at one of these things, and you'll be able to AFK to your heart's content. But why stop there? As it turns out, there's even a way to get more juice out of this machine. Wouldn't you know it, but just by throwing down a grindstone next to this whole mess, you can squeeze out extra levels from the various pieces of enchanted gear you get along the way. When you fish farm as much as I do, you got chests upon double chests of the stuff just lying around doing nothing. So instead of collecting dust, I'd say let them do the work for you. I'm not breaking any new ground by saying that the Elytra is an invaluable item to Minecraft. And sure enough, it's transformed the landscape of survival. So if you're trying to impress your friends who also have Elytra wings, then you might be able to do that by flying through a one by one hole. By lining yourself upright, you can get a clean shot through a one by one hole just like that. And to any bystanders, it looks like you pull it off the impossible. So by throwing a couple of one by one gaps into your base, you might be able to impress those friends who just use the Elytra for long distance travel. And with that folks, YouTube thinks that you might like this video. So see if they're right and have a good one. All right.